Love them or hate them, e-bikes like this Canyon Torque On and Yuba Spicy Curry are here to stay. And so is the complicated jargon used to explain them. But many of these new terms aren't as arduous as they sound. And by the time you finish this video, you'll be talking e-bikes with the best of them. So whether you're new to cycling altogether or a seasoned pro looking to learn more about this rapidly growing side of the industry, you're in the right place. First up, let's talk about the motor. And the first two words you'll probably hear when talking about said motor is torque and watts. And if you're anything like me, I got those two words mixed up quite a bit. Let's begin by talking about torque. Torque is a measure of rotational force and is usually measured in the unit Newton meters. Higher torque numbers will increase acceleration, make it easier to ride up hills and increase the amount of weight that you can carry on the bike at the expense of drawing a little more power from your battery. Torque usually ranges from about 30 to 90 Newton meters, depending on the type of bike. This Canyon Torque on here produces 85 Newton meters in its boost setting. Riders who plan to ride a lot of hills, like on a mountain bike, or who do a lot of starting and stopping, or just value acceleration, should look into purchasing a bike with a higher torque value. Now though, let's move on to that second term, which is watts. Watts are a measurement of the e-bike's power, or in other words, the motor's capacity to do work. E-bike motors usually range from about 250 watts to 750 watts, and depending on where you live, there may be a limit on how much wattage your e-bike can have before you have to register it as a motorcycle. For reference, this Canyon Torque On has a 500 watt Shimano EP801 motor, and that 500 watt figure is the maximum output for this motor. But many bikes like this Canyon Torque On actually have various modes where you can adjust the amount of assistance that you're getting while pedaling. This bike in particular also has a walk mode, which means it'll give you a little bit of non-pedal assisted power to help push that bike up extra technical terrain that you might not be able to ride up anyway. So what's the point of having higher wattage? Well, that power that it's providing is actually what's translating to the Newtons that are giving you that acceleration. And bikes with a higher wattage motor will allow you to reach higher speeds, even when you're loaded down with a lot of gear. That said though, pretty much every e-bike has some type of governor built into it, and we'll talk more about that here in a second. So unless you're carrying big heavy loads, you shouldn't have to worry too much about getting a bike with the maximal wattage. Again, it's that torque number, the Newton meters, that's probably a little bit more applicable. So in summary, that torque number is a little bit more important than wattage when looking for and comparing e-bikes, but you should consider getting a bike with a high wattage motor if you value top speed for say long distance commuting, or you plan to carry big loads like you would on that Yuba Spicy Curry. Speaking of the Spicy Curry, it like many other modern, more high-end e-bikes has a mid drive motor that sits around the bottom bracket in the frame. In this case, the power is delivered to the rear wheel through the drivetrain, making for a more natural riding experience. Since a mid-drive motor uses the bike's gears, it also allows the motor to always be working in its optimal torque range, increasing efficiency and top speed. Lastly, a mid-drive motor also puts that weight low and in the middle of the bike, optimizing weight distribution. So you should choose a bike with a mid-drive motor if you're looking for the most refined power delivery system and you want just a bit more nimble, agile bike, maybe for mountain biking or e-road biking, because again, that motor is gonna be right there in the middle, as opposed to on your back wheel, like it is on a hub drive motor. Unlike mid drive motors that put the power through the drivetrain, hub drive motors apply their torque directly to the back wheel. These tend to be more affordable and lighter weight than mid drive motors because of their inherent simplicity. That said, they tend to be a bit less efficient and powerful than their mid drive counterpart. Another perk of the hub drive motor is that it allows the frame to be a bit more simple without having to mount a motor right there. So who should choose a hub drive motor? Well, first up, riders on a budget. As like I said a second ago, they tend to be a bit more expensive, but also riders who wanna have a clean, sleek frame, maybe be a little bit harder to tell that it's an e-bike, then hub drive motors are a good option for that. Moving on then to the battery. And almost all modern e-bikes use lithium ion batteries like this one here on the Yuba Spicy Curry. And their size is measured in watt hours, or in other words, how much time it will take them to completely drain the battery. These batteries can range in size depending on the bike from about 250 watt hours up to 1000 watt hours. For reference, the Yuba Spicy Curry has a 500 watt hour battery. Since lithium ion batteries are not light, their weight and size is the biggest trade-off for going with a larger battery. 
If you plan to use your e-bike for really long rides or maybe have long periods of time between charging or just don't care about weight, then a bigger battery is the way to go. But if you prioritize a lightweight bike that looks and feels a bit more like a traditional analog bike, then you might consider going with something with a slightly smaller battery. Speaking of bikes with smaller batteries, many of these will come with an optional range extender, which is an additional removable battery that's usually around 100 to 250 watts and oftentimes sits in a standard water bottle cage. And that brings us to our third term, which is range. That's essentially how far the manufacturer claims the bike can go in a single charge. And as of right now, there is no industry standard on how this is measured. So take those terms with a grain of salt. For instance, some manufacturers might do it in hilly terrain on their trail or middle mode, and some might just do it on a straight paved surface in their eco mode. So do a little research before landing on a bike simply due to its range. The last battery related topic to talk about is where that battery is stored. And there's essentially three different options. Number one is in the frame, like on this Canyon Torque On. Oftentimes this is gonna be seated inside the down tube and gives the bike a lot cleaner look as well as helps protect that battery from the elements. The second and probably most common thing you'll see is a battery that's located on the frame, like what you've seen on the Yuba Spicy Curry. Oftentimes these will be placed on the down tube or seat tube and allow for easy access to the battery as well as a slightly less expensive manufacturing process. Lastly, some urban e-bikes mount their battery to a rack, which again makes it real easy to take on and off, but the only problem with this is that oftentimes that weight sits a little higher on the bike, making it a bit harder to handle. Now that you have a basic understanding of the terms associated with e-bikes and how they impact the riding experience, the last thing to talk about is the various categories that e-bikes are placed into. Sadly though, this can get pretty complicated because these categories and the laws and regulations regarding them differ quite a bit from region to region. So to keep things simple, in this video, I'm just gonna be talking about how they categorize them here in the United States. And I'll put links down in the description that will give you those categories and laws for the UK, EU, and Canada. Here in the United States, we use the term classes to define e-bikes and the main three are class one, class two and class three. Each of these three classes has a motor size limited to 750 watts. And as long as that motor is under 750 watts, it does not need to be registered as a motor vehicle. First up is class one, which just so happens to be what this Canyon Torque On is. Class one bikes are pedal assist, meaning they don't have a throttle and they're governed at a top speed of 20 miles an hour. These are most commonly found on mountain bikes and more casual bikes where there's really no need to have a pedal assist motor going over 20 miles an hour. Now, that's not to say that the bike can't be ridden above those speeds, but you're not gonna get any assistance from the motor once you hit that. Next up, we're gonna talk about class three e-bikes. And I know you're probably thinking I skipped two. Don't worry, I'm gonna come back to two in a second, but it actually makes a bit more sense to talk about class three e-bikes like this Yuba Spicy Curry next. Class three e-bikes are also pedal assist. There's not a throttle, but instead of being capped at 20 miles an hour, they can go up to 28 miles an hour before that electric assistance cuts off. These are most commonly found on commuting bikes or e-road bikes that tend to go at higher speeds. The last category to talk about is class two, which have a throttle, meaning you can ride them without pedaling and they are limited to 20 miles an hour. These are most often found on casual commuter bikes and cruisers, and will give you the closest thing you can get to a motorcycle experience without having to register your vehicle. Lastly, keep in mind that most class two e-bikes are not allowed on trails where other pedal assist bikes like class ones and threes are allowed. Well, that's a wrap on our conversation about e-bike terminology. If you have any more questions about e-bikes or the terms we talked about today, you can go ahead and leave those down there in the comments. Otherwise, I'd love to hear your thoughts on e-bikes in general. I know it can be a bit of a controversial subject, so let's keep it nice down there, but I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions. While you're down there, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and subscribe to the 99 Spokes YouTube channel. We've got new videos coming out every week and that way you won't miss any of them. Lastly, remember that bikes are for everyone. Have fun out there.